Do you know that the first astronauts didn't have a toilet at all? The first American astronaut and the second man in space, Alan Shepard, found himself in a very awkward situation. His flight was only supposed to last 15 minutes, so the engineers didn't install any toilet inside his spacecraft. Shepard took his seat in the spaceship about an hour before the scheduled launch. But due to weather conditions and technical problems, the rocket launch was delayed by two hours. Alan Shepard was lying on his back in the spaceship all this time. At one point, he felt the need to go number one. He reported it to ground control, but if Alan Shepard got out of the rocket to do his business, it would delay the rocket launch indefinitely. So, ground control didn't let him out of the rocket. The only option for him was to try and relax. In the end, he did his business right inside his suit. It's a good thing his spacesuit and the clothes underneath were made of cotton, which is quite absorbent and soaked up all the liquid. So Alan Shepard completed his flight in comfort and relatively dry. Though he still needed to turn off the sensors in his suit because if they got wet they could cause a short circuit. But the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin, managed to solve the same problem before the rocket was launched. When he was transported to the rocket by bus, a couple of minutes before they arrived at the rocket, he asked for a stop and relieved himself. This way, Yuri Gagarin made his nearly two-hour flight in comfort. So remember, always go to the restroom before a long trip. Later, NASA took care of astronauts' call of nature using the following device, as they sent people into space on more extended missions. It consisted of a cylinder that an astronaut had to put on. Astronauts placed this system on straps near their waists. This cylinder was connected to a bag that collected all the waste. That was the first NASA toilet. Comfortable and cheap. NASA also tried to experiment with astronauts' diets. It was all about slowing down the digestive process and prolonging the time between eating food and drinking water to produce waste. One of the astronauts, John Glenn, tried this method out. His flight around Earth lasted about five hours. A special diet and medication allowed the astronaut to avoid the call of nature for a relatively long time. He did his business right before re-entering the atmosphere. When scientists analyzed his waste, they found out that its volume was 35% more than the average person's bladder could hold at maximum capacity. But the astronaut had no complaints about his condition and he said the flight had been quite comfortable. I know that now when astronauts spend time inside a space station or a spacecraft in outer space, they sometimes wear their spacesuits for up to 9 hours. It means that using the regular toilet on board isn't really an option. The solution to this problem is simple. Diapers. They are more advanced than the ones sold on Earth, of course, with a special absorbent sewn into the fabric. It can keep an astronaut's body dry for a long time. As you already know, I am a high school teacher. If we went with my students on a school excursion to the International Space Station, the first question they would ask would probably be, Tom, where's the restroom? Well, of course, they would be also excited to learn about the cosmos, but it turns out that using a restroom in zero gravity might be quite a challenge for which one needs to be prepared. If you take a hose in your backyard and start watering your flowers, the water comes out in a solid stream. The gravity captures it and falls where you aim. And in space, as you know, there's almost no gravity. So the water that comes out of the hose keeps flying in the same direction. And if you have to hit a precise target, it's even more difficult. The stream can break into droplets. They will start bouncing off the walls, going down and flying up. So 
If you're trying to use a regular toilet in space, you would be surrounded by flying droplets. The solution to this problem is to create a force that will attract the waste. If not gravity, then vacuum. Like the one we have in airplane toilets. After pressing the flush button there, you always hear a humming sound. That's the fan that starts pumping the air out of the waste tank. When the pressure is low enough, the hole in the drain opens and all the waste is instantly pulled down. And this is how the space toilet works at the International Space Station, where you have to create such vacuum from the very beginning. This way, the hose water will form a stream, not because of gravity, but the air pulled inside by a fan. Oh, and regular toilets won't do. If you need to use the bathroom on the ISS, you need to take a hose and turn the toilet on with a button. The fan inside will start spinning, pulling in the air. You'll do your business essentially into a vacuum cleaner. There's a unique funnel shaped hose end so that both men and women can use the toilet. A suction air stream picks up all the droplets and directs them into the tank. Then comes the whole waste cleaning system with many filters and chemicals. There's also a tank of powerful acid. It's there to dissolve any solid formations in the waste. Otherwise, they can clog the filters and valves and complex systems and cause a breakdown. A leaky toilet is a very unpleasant thing when you're locked in a tight space without gravity. That acid can easily dissolve even some metals. That's why space toilet materials are made of special titanium alloys, super resistant and very expensive. After being cleaned, the waste gets turned into drinking water. It means that with time, you'll turn it into the garbage again and the cycle will repeat and repeat all over. Don't worry, the purification system works exceptionally well, so there's no harm in drinking the water. And your coffee also won't taste any worse. Things are a little more complicated if you run to the toilet for number two. Then, just like on Earth, you'll have to lift the toilet lid first. At this point, the same fan as in the previous case turns on. It should already be working to prevent bad smells. Then it would help if you sat on the toilet. And here's another challenge. It's hard to do it in zero gravity. So there are straps for your feet and handles to hold on to. The fan does a job and your business goes into the waste tank. Paper and tissues go in there too. Each portion of solid waste then goes into a bag and gets sealed. And then the system sends these waste bags to a special canister. These canisters are stored on the ISS until a cargo spacecraft arrives there. The astronauts receive food and water supplies and scientific equipment. Then they load the cargo spacecraft with canisters of human waste and other garbage. After that, it undocks and prefers to return to Earth. But since cargo spaceships burn up entirely due to friction against the air in the upper atmosphere, all the waste gets disposed of before reaching the planet's surface. Another option astronauts have is to throw the canisters with waste directly into the open space. Earth's gravity eventually attracts the containers and they too burn up in the atmosphere. Currently, NASA is developing a system that could recycle waste of number two into water. After all, water is a precious resource on the International Space Station. So this space toilet, which is a little thing about the size of a scooter, costs around $23 million. That includes manufacturing and a dozen years of development. And this price doesn't even include the delivery to the International Space Station. For that money, you could buy a Bugatti Veyron, the most expensive car in the world, or something similar. Or a private jet, for example. Or you can become an island owner. You can even buy a few of them for that money. But okay, let's get back to space. The journey starts at the launch pad. The rocket that will later deliver the cargo to the ISS is assembled. Ignition! 
the rocket engines turn on. They burn hundreds of pounds of fuel every second. The rocket goes up, and when all the fuel is burned, the rocket's first stage undocks. It returns to Earth and makes a soft landing. The booster can be used again after refueling. Once the booster is undocked, the rocket's second stage fires the engines. More fuel is burned so that the rocket can reach the ISS altitude of about 250 miles above the sea level. Once in orbit, the cargo spacecraft docks with the ISS. And voila! The space toilet is delivered. But it costs about 50 million to launch a booster rocket like Falcon 9. We also plan to send people to Mars and the trip will take them about 7 months. So we should create a comfortable bathroom for the astronauts probably. <laughs> the design of the 23 million toilets is bound to be improved. Let's wish the engineers to make it smaller and lighter, so this way it uses less space and saves more fuel. Thank you for watching today, Brightsiders. And remember, let's learn something new every day together with Brightside. Hundreds of diplomatic spaceships take off from Earth and head into space. When they reach their destination, they're met by hundreds of alien ships. This is humanity's first contact with an extraterrestrial civilization. People managed to detect them not so long ago, in a star system very close to our home. It's Proxima Centauri. This red dwarf star is the closest to our solar system. It's seven times smaller than our sun, which makes it only 50% bigger than Jupiter. Proxima Centauri is also eight times as light as the sun. This star system is 4.2 light years away. That's how long it takes a photon of light to travel from this star to Earth. By comparison, it only takes eight minutes for sunlight to reach our planet. If you decided to travel to Proxima Centauri, it would take you about 73,000 years to fly there in a conventional rocket. That's longer than our intelligent civilization has even existed. But it's not the star itself that interests us, it's the planet orbiting it. That's Proxima Centauri b. It's 17% bigger than Earth and about 10% heavier. It orbits its star at a distance of 4.5 million miles. By comparison, Earth is 93 million miles away from the Sun. That's 20 times farther. But the host star, Proxima Centauri, is a red dwarf. It doesn't emit as much light and heat as our Sun. So the planet Proxima Centauri b is right in the habitable zone of the star. It's located at such a perfect distance from its mother star that the planet neither gets too hot nor turns into a block of ice. In other words, the temperature there makes it possible for water to exist in its liquid state. This means that Proxima Centauri b could host life. But further observations of the planet make it doubtful. The host star is very unstable. Its brightness changes too frequently. In 2017, astronomers witnessed a catastrophic flash. The star increased its brightness by 1,000 times for 10 seconds. Before that, there was another weaker flash the planet received an enormous amount of radiation. If there had been life there, that flare would have wiped it out completely. Overall, Proxima Centauri b receives about 400 times more X-rays than Earth. Complex living organisms cannot live under such conditions. Scientists say that even if there was an atmosphere and an ocean on Proxima Centauri b, this constant radiation would simply blow them off the planet. Proxima Centauri b is so close to its host star that it's gravitationally locked to it. This means that the planet is always turned to the star with only one side, just like the moon is turned toward Earth. That means that only one side of the planet receives this awful amount of radiation. And some experts speculate that an intelligent civilization might live on the night side of the planet. And it could be this civilization that sent us the strange signal that astronomers caught in 2019. Scientists described it as, quote, a bright, long-duration optical flare, accompanied by a series of intense, coherent radio bursts. This radio signal was observed for 30 days by one of the radio telescopes on Earth. Scientists thought the signal was artificial and could have been sent by an extraterrestrial civilization. Presumably, the signal came from Proxima Centauri b, or one of the moons that might be in that star system. But further observations failed to detect the signal. Now, the main theory claims that this radio signal is just some kind of interference from some technology on Earth. 
but what if it was really sent by a civilization living on the dark side of Proxima Centauri B? Well, we may soon find out for sure. People are launching a brand new telescope into space. It's the James Webb Space Telescope. It's scheduled to be launched at the end of 2021. A booster rocket will take off from Earth and reach orbit. Then, it'll deliver the telescope to a specific point between our planet and the Sun, where their gravitational forces are roughly equal. Plus, there's no light pollution in space, unlike on Earth's surface. There are also no clouds or other weather conditions that might interfere with the telescope. The James Webb Space Telescope will replace the Hubble Telescope, which has been operating in space since 1990. The new telescope costs $9.8 billion, and here's why. It'll use a mirror as wide as a boxing ring. This will allow the telescope to see very far into space. So far, in fact, that the light from some events happening there won't have reached Earth yet. This means we will literally be able to look back in time. The James Webb Space Telescope will see the universe almost immediately after the Big Bang. We'll see how the first stars and galaxies were born, and how the universe turned into what we observe today. But also, this telescope can be used to examine Proxima Centauri b. Astronomers will be looking for artificial light there, like the LED lights we have on Earth. If Proxima Centauri b really hosts life on its night side, then the locals must have learned to transfer heat and light from the day side of the planet, and they would have to use artificial light to support life on their side. The James Webb Space Telescope is powerful enough to distinguish the light waves emitted by the star from those that might be created by someone on the dark side of the planet. And if we do detect some artificial light, we'll have the first ever confirmation that an intelligent civilization might exist outside our solar system. But there's always room for error in calculations and data interpretation. The only way to establish the truth once and for all is to send a space probe to Proxima Centauri. Then we can get real pictures of the planet. The main problem is distance. Although Proxima Centauri is the closest to the Earth's star system, it still takes tens of thousands of years to get there. After all, the Voyager 1 space probe needed about 44 years just to leave the solar system. And that's just a small step compared to the actual distance to the nearest star. So we need other methods of travel, and they have to be much faster. Some scientists want to send microprobes to Proxima Centauri b. They won't be any heavier than a sewing needle. A launch vehicle will deploy about a thousand of these probes into orbit. Then they will unfold a space sail. This is an ultralight material that will use the power of light to create thrust. When the sail is deployed, we'll focus a powerful laser beam onto it. This will accelerate the probes to about 20% of the speed of light. This will be an absolute speed record by our standards, but it'll still take about 21 years for these probes to reach their destination. And we'll have to wait for about four more years just to get the first signal from them. The Proxima Centauri star system isn't the only potential world to host life. And one of the tasks of the James Webb Space Telescope is to look out for other worlds. The telescope's powerful instruments will allow it to find relatively cold planets where temperatures are close to those on Earth. We'll be able to study in detail around two dozen nearby star systems, and we'll be able to detect not only planets themselves, but also their moons. Scientists expect a boom in the discovery of exoplanets. From the start of the telescope in 2022, we'll constantly be detecting new worlds and learning more about those already discovered. The James Webb Space Telescope will allow us to better study our own solar system, Jupiter's moon Europa, for example. Scientists believe there might be water there. Although Europa looks like a block of ice, the moon's gravitational interaction with Jupiter heats its core. That likely makes the ice deep below the surface melt. So there's likely to be an ocean under the ice crust. Similar conditions could exist on Enceladus, Saturn's moon. This moon is geologically active. There are geysers that burst out of the cracks on the moon's surface. The James Webb Space Telescope's infrared instruments will be able to explore Europa and Enceladus in search of biosignatures. Those are the traces of life activity of living organisms or bacteria. This telescope is scheduled to operate for about six years. But in the future, we'll launch an even bigger one. It's called Louvoir, which stands for the Large UV Optical Infrared Surveyor. Its mirror will be twice the size of that of the James Webb Space Telescope, 
and almost seven times the size of the Hubble's. The telescope is scheduled to be launched in 2039. We'll get it into orbit with the help of a super heavy rocket. Then we'll have to deliver the telescope to its destination, one million miles away from Earth. And then it'll begin its observations. We could learn to travel faster than the speed of light by that time. Then, if we find a potentially habitable planet with the help of the telescope, we can send a space probe or even a team of explorers there. In this case, a diplomatic meeting with an extraterrestrial civilization might become a reality. On August 20th, 1977, the most ambitious space mission took off from Earth. The main goal of Voyager 2 was to study the outer solar system up close. It became possible because of a rare alignment of planets. Voyager 2 was supposed to study all the gas giants of the solar system – Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Astronomers also hoped it would be able to find and explore the edge of the solar system. Since Voyager 2 was built for interstellar travel, the probe was equipped with a large 12-foot-wide antenna. It allowed the spaceship to send the data it gathered back to Earth. During its journey, the space probe discovered a 14th moon of Jupiter. Voyager 2 was the only spaceship to study all four giant planets from up close. It was the first human-made object to fly past Uranus, where it found two new rings and ten new moons. Voyager 2 also flew by Neptune and noticed its great dark spot. That's a colossal spinning storm in the planet's southern hemisphere. The storm is the size of Earth and moves at a speed of 1,500 miles per hour. These winds are the strongest ever recorded on any planet of the solar system. In the history of space exploration, only five spacecraft have managed to leave the gravitational pull of the solar system. Those were Pioneer 10 and 11, Voyager 1 and 2, and New Horizons. People launch thousands of objects into space. These objects easily overcome Earth's gravity. But the Sun is around 300,000 times as massive as our home planet. That's why its gravitational pull is way more difficult to find. Even more impressively, Voyager 2 is the second human-made object in history to reach the space between stars after passing through the heliosphere. That's a bubble of magnetic fields and particles produced by the Sun and protecting the solar system. Two years after its launch, Voyager 2 started transmitting the first images of Jupiter. The space probe provided scientists with much-needed information about Io and Europa, some of the largest of Jupiter's moons. Then the space mission passed by the gas giant itself. The distance between the spacecraft and the planet was around 400,000 miles. That's when the probe noticed some changes in the shape and color of the Great Red Spot. It's an enormous, long-lived storm system, like a hurricane on Earth, but much, much larger. Two years later, Voyager 2 reached Saturn. It discovered spokes and kinks in some of the planet's rings. While the spacecraft was flying behind and up past the gas giant, it passed through the plane of Saturn's rings. At that time, Voyager's speed was around 8 miles per second. For several minutes, the probe was hit by thousands of micron-sized grains of dust. This kept shifting the probe's direction, and its control jets had to fire many times to stabilize the vehicle. After Voyager 2 explored Uranus and Neptune, it headed out of the solar system. Its instruments were put in low power to save energy. In August 2007, the spacecraft passed the terminal shot. It's the boundary marking the outer limit of the sun's influence. Here, the solar wind slows down. In the summer of 2013, the probe reached interstellar space. Now, when it comes to sending and receiving signals in space, there are three factors you should keep in mind – distance, power, and time. The farther away a spacecraft is, the farther a signal has to travel before it reaches it, and the longer it takes for this signal to catch up with the spacecraft. And when it finally gets there, it's extremely weak. Another problem is that once the spacecraft is launched, it can't be upgraded. It's literally stuck with the technology it was outfitted with. Plus, such spaceships as Voyager 2 are powered by radioactive fuel. When special material radioactively decays, it releases heat that gets converted into electricity. Unfortunately, the more material decays away, the less power the spacecraft has for receiving and transmitting radio signals. Despite this issue, we haven't lost the connection with Voyager 1 and 2. 
That's because new and more powerful technologies appear on Earth. Signals people send can reach much farther than before. That's why it was possible to stay in touch with Voyager 2, which entered interstellar space in 2018 and has already traveled almost 12 billion miles away from Earth. But in March 2020, the main piece of equipment that allowed scientists to exchange signals with the spaceship was switched off. After the communication with the spacecraft stopped, NASA spent around 11 months upgrading its deep space network and installing new hardware. The DSN is an international array of huge radio antennas that help astronomers on Earth communicate with interplanetary missions. These antennas are located in California, Madrid, and Canberra. The one used to keep in touch with Voyager 2 is a 230-foot wide dish in Canberra. This is the only equipment that can send commands that can reach the probe. This antenna, known as DSS-43, started operating in 1972 five years before Voyager 2 and 1 were launched. At that time, it was only 210 feet across. Since then, the dish has received a lot of repairs and upgrades. But these 11 months were the longest the antenna was offline. In October 2020, the antenna was finally ready for a trial after all the upgrades and repairs. The mission operator sent a set of commands to Voyager 2. And after many months of radio silence, the spacecraft returned the signal. The probe confirmed it had heard the call. After that, the spacecraft carried out the commands. While the dish was offline, the mission operators could actually receive scientific data and health updates from Voyager 2. Astronomers kept getting data from interstellar space, the region outside the Sun's heliosphere. But they couldn't send any commands to the probe, since it had traveled too far away from Earth. The upgraded antenna received two new radio transmitters, and it was done just in time. One of the transmitters that was used to communicate with Voyager 2 hadn't been replaced in almost 50 years. The antenna also got new cooling and heating equipment and other electronics necessary to support the advanced transmitters. Now, a curious thing about the Deep Space Network is that its radio antennas are positioned in a very precise way. They're spaced equally around the globe. This way, almost any spacecraft can stay in touch with at least one facility at all times. But Voyager 2 is an exception. In 1989, it made a close flyby of Triton, Neptune's moon. It was the only close encounter people had with the eighth planet of the solar system and its moon. By the way, Triton is the largest known object that is believed to be born in the Kuiper Belt. That's a donut-shaped ring around the sun full of icy objects. Voyager 2 discovered Neptune's ring system and its tiny inner moons. The probe also gathered a lot of amazing information about Triton. For example, it became clear that the moon is covered in cryovolcanoes. Instead of spewing molten rock, these volcanoes spit ice consisting of water, ammonia, and methane. When the New Horizons spacecraft flew past Pluto more than 25 years later, it discovered the same phenomenon on the dwarf planet. Anyway, to make this detour, Voyager 2 had to travel over the gas giant's North Pole. But this changed the probe's trajectory, deflecting it southward relative to the planes of the planets. Since then, Voyager 2 has been moving in that direction. And now, the spacecraft is so far away that it's out of reach of the radio antennas in the Northern Hemisphere, those in Madrid and California. This makes DSS-43, which is located in the Southern Hemisphere, the only dish powerful enough in broadcasting just the right frequency to send commands to Voyager 2. Voyager 1, the probe's faster-traveling twin, didn't change its trajectory. After passing by Saturn, it took a different path. That's why now it can easily communicate with the two facilities in the Northern Hemisphere. The upgrade the Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex has gone through can also benefit other space missions. For example, the Mars Perseverance rover that landed on the Red Planet on February 18, 2021. The dish will also be crucial for exploring other planets and the moon.